Welcome and thank you for joining us for our online artist talk with LaToya M. Hobbs, the fifth in our Black Women of Print speaker series, an, or an organization that makes visible the narratives and works of Black women printmakers, past, present, and future. I'm Sarah Kirk Hanley, the Executive Director of Manhattan Graphic Center. Our events are made possible by grants from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, uh, New York State Council on the Arts, the Pierre and Tana Matisse Foundation, and our supporters. Thank you. MGC's online artist talks under COVID-19 are made possible with funds from the NISCA Electronic Media Film in partnership with Wave Farm Media Arts Alliance Assistance Fund with the support of Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature. This evening, we are delighted to welcome Latoya M. Hobbs to speak about her work. She'll give us an overview of her career and her influences and talk about some things that are on the horizon for her, which are very exciting. Um, Latoya M. Hobbs is an artist, wife, and mother of two from Little Rock, Air, Arkansas, who is currently living and working in Baltimore, Maryland. She received her BA in painting from the University of Arkansas at Little Rock and an MFA in printmaking from Purdue University. Latoya's work deals with figurative imagery that addresses ideas of beauty, cultural identity, and womanhood as they relate to women of the African diaspora. She creates a fluid and symbiotic relationship between her printmaking and painting practice, producing works that are marked by texture, color, and bold patterns, as you will see soon. Her exhibition record includes several national and international exhibits in locations such as the National Art Gallery in Namibia, Namibia, I don't say that very often, excuse me, Windhoek, Nim uh, Syracuse, New York, Women Made Gallery, Chicago, Illinois, and the Sophia Wanamaker Galleries in San Jose, Costa Rica, among others. Latoya's work has also been featured in Transition, an international review, which is a publication of the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for African and African American Research at Harvard University. Her work is housed in private and public collections such as the Petrucci Foundation Collection of African American Art, the Mosaic Templars Cultural Center, and the National Arts Gallery of Namibia. Other Accomplishments include a 2019 Individual Artist Award from the Maryland State Council, Arts Council, a 2019 Artist Travel Grant awarded by the Municipal Art Society of Baltimore, a 2020 Artist in Residence Award at the Joan Mitchell Center in New Orleans, Louisiana, and she was the winner of the 2020 Jane and Walter Sondheim Artscape Prize in Baltimore. She, additionally, LaToya devotes her time and teaching and to inspiring young artists as a professor at the Maryland Institute College of Art. You are a busy lady. And thank you for taking some time today to uh, tell us about your work. So I'll let you take it away, LaToya. Sure. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, good afternoon or evening, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and listen to me talk about my work. I also like to thank the Manhattan Graphic Center for hosting me and my print uh, sisters, allowing us to use your platform to spread uh, more information about our work and about our organization. Um, so I always like to start off my presentations with this slide. Uh, so this is an image of me and my family. Um, my husband, Arison Jacks, my two little boys, Ade and Theo. Um, as was mentioned in my bio, I'm originally from Little Rock, Arkansas, but I currently live and work in Baltimore, Maryland. I've been here for about going on nine years or so. Um, and I'm also a professor at the Maryland Institute College of Art. So to start off the presentation, I'm gonna um, quickly go through some of my major influences. I'm influenced by a lot of people, but I think these uh, people kind of represent um, a sample of the poor people who are kind of influencing my practice right now. So Elizabeth Catlett, all time, hands down, number one influence in terms of my printmaking practice. Um, 
she was the reason I really decided to pursue printmaking because I never actually wanted to be a printmaker at all, <laughs> ironically. But once I discovered her work, it just kind of showed me what was possible with this medium. And I also was really drawn to the way she represented um, women in her work. Other Black women printmakers who um, have influenced me are Margaret Burroughs um, and also Valerie Maynard, who is a living legend here in Baltimore. Um, next, we have Eliezer Couture. Again, it just was really... Um, enamored by the poetic way he displayed women um, in his work, Berkeley L. Hendricks. Um, the first time I saw his exhi exhibition, Birth of the Pool, um, at the Studio Museum in Harlem, it kind of just changed my life as a figurative painter. Nicolene Thomas, um, I'm really drawn to just the um, expertise in terms of the use of materials, um, and also just the boldness with which he displays Black women in their work. Um, and Jadika, excuse me, Angelica Crosby. Um, she inspires me because of just the mastery of her materials um, and also how she takes all these different uh, things and kind of combines them together on the same surface, which is something I'm really into now with my work. And also I'm really enjoy the way that um, she uses space as a way to enhance the narrative behind the figures that she portrays. And then last, Carrie James Marshall. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about his work later in the presentation, but um, his uh, exhibition mastery uh, was kind of a life-changing experience for me as an artist. Um, yes, I'll talk a little bit more about him later. So those are some of my influences. Um, now I'm just going to kind of show you some uh, examples of early work, and I'm going to kind of speed through these for sake of time because I really want to spend more time talking about like the newer work that I'm doing. Um, so these pieces were some of my first like linoleum cuts where I was kind of really um, starting to understand the carving process. Um, like I said before, I never really intended to be a printmaker. Um, I was more focused on painting in undergrad, but we had to take printmaking as a part of our curriculum. Um, and so again, my printmaking professor, AJ Smith, at the time, he just saw the type of imagery that I was making. And then he said, you know, based on what you're drawing, you need to be looking at Elizabeth Catlett's work. And so once I saw her work, it made me become more serious about being a printmaker. So here are some early works, um, pretty small in scale. Um, like around nine by 12, um, 18 by 24, so a little bit smaller in size. Let me explore some other processes like multi-block um, printing and also reduction printing. And then here is where we see um, around 2010 is where I start to really jump in terms of the scale of my work. So I was, went from doing around like 18 by 24 and now to like 45 by 28. Um, and so part of the uh, jump in scale was um, me just kind of having a reverence for the women that I was portraying in my work. Um, and I also started to incorporate uh, the use of patterns, which you'll kind of see um, that motif repeated through a lot of my pieces. Um, so this section is just on the process of being a relief printmaker. So I don't wanna, even though we're, you know, this is the Manhattan Graphic Center, um, I don't wanna take for granted that people are familiar with the process of printmaking. So I just, the teacher in me kind of just wants to <laughs> explain. Um, so here is like the matrix. And so the matrix is whatever surface that you're printing on. And so for me as a relief artist, um, I use wood or in this particular instance, this is MDF. Um, so you can see here, there's a detailed drawing and you can kind of see that the carving process has started. And so these are the example of some of the types of tools that I use. Uh, once the block is carved, then you go through inking process and then kind of recarving to touch things up. And then the block is transferred to a printing press um, and a piece of paper is pressed, placed on top. And then once you roll the block through the press, the pressure um, transfers the ink to the paper and then you have your final print. So great to see the scale of the, these these prints on that press. And I, I just realized I forgot to tell you all to uh, put your questions in the Q&A function if you have any. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you for that reminder. Um, yeah, I, I like to have actual images that show the scale of the work because sometimes, you know, um, you just aren't aware from images. Um, yeah, and that that's very hard online. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and so these images were uh, taken from a workshop with Big Ink. I don't know if you guys have heard of that, but they have a mo mobile printing press. And so they basically tour the country and they meet with printmakers to produce large scale with us. 
Um, so now I'm going to briefly talk about a couple of um, bodies of work, the first being Beautiful Uprising. Um, so the research focus for this uh, series kind of um, explored the intersection of race, beauty, and identity, particularly with women of African descent in three specific areas. So I was really exploring um, hair culture, um, color, colorism um, via skin complexion, and also just this general idea of body image. Um, and so these next few images kind of speak directly to hair, black hair culture. And though, so they're kind of reflective of my own experiences um, from transitioning to having like straight hair um, to having natural hair and just kind of um, the negativity that I experienced uh, because of making that physical change with my hair. And um, I was just kind of questioning why a lot of those negative experiences came from other black people, which is not what I, um, had expected. So it just kind of um, caused me to ask the question of why that is and exploring this idea of internalizing racism and how that could um, play a part in the beauty preferences that we as Black women choose to uphold. So here are a couple more images in this series. So all of them are intended just to show the versatility um, that Black women can have with their hair, and also just to present another um, another interpretation of what is beautiful. I love the pattern of the the hair that kind of weaves into the background there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in, in, in these instances, I'm also specifically using the noise as kind of a design tool as well to kind of lead you uh, throughout the work. Okay, so this um, installation speaks directly to the idea of colorism. Um, so basically it's when um, people of a certain race kind of judge each other based on your skin complexion. And so the higher your skin complexion is, uh, the more preferential treatment you receive and um, the darker your skin is, um, the less desired it is considered to be. Uh, so this is an installation that's based on the brown paper bag test. And so um, basically you would hold your arm up to a brown paper bag. And if you were darker than that, then you were again considered un unacceptable. And so what I did with this uh, project is I kind of took note of how Black women described their skin. Um, and so I would, you know, just kind of jot down how I describe my skin, how other people would describe my skin from my hometown, and also just kind of reading in like beauty blogs and magazines how people would note their skin. And so you have like high yellow or um, a mocha chocolate or um, um, cocoa brown. So I took all of these phrases and screen printed them on... Um, these brown paper bags and just kind of put them up as like a barrier in the gallery space is symbolic of how like people were kind of um, blocked from participating in certain parts of society just based on their skin complexion. And so here's another detailed shot. And so I love when this piece is up just because of um, the conversation that it sparks for people who were not necessarily aware of this um, test specifically, but they're aware of how other ways of colorism still like exist in um, our society today. And so sometimes people do like the, the paper bag test on themselves like this person is here. Um, and then this last, these last few images from this series talk uh, directly to the idea of body image. Um, and so, you know, for me, I think about the body as the vessel that houses all of your attributes, right? So how you, your internal workings and also like your, just your physical self. Um, so with this project, I took time to interview the models who, you know, I asked them to do, to do portraits of them, but I wanted to make sure that they were represented not just physically, but also mentally. And so I just got them to write about how they saw themselves um, as Black women, what they thought about beauty, what they thought um, beauty was to them, and also just the process of an artist wanting to recreate their image uh, as artwork. And so I'm really bad with titles. <laughs> Titling my work is like one of the least favorite things, <laughs> part of the process for me. Um, but because I had all these statements, for me, it was really natural to pull excerpts from their statements and use that to title the work. Um, I also would put the statements in the work itself. So if you can see this image, it's kind of hard to see. But the first thing that I would do before I did any drawing or put any of the figure in is I would just literally write their words as the foundation of the work. Yeah, I think the titles really help give context to the piece. If you were just encountering it in a gallery or something, it would help you really understand the, the gist of where you're going with that. Yeah. Um, we did have a question about the paper bags. Um, okay. If we could go back for one second. Are they all the same um, color? So um, they're slightly different. Mm -hmm. uh, so I ordered 
like a big box of paper bags from Uline and then I ran out. <laughs> um, and so I didn't have time to order more. So I just had to go to the grocery store and get more, <laughs> more paper bags. And so they're kind of slightly, maybe there's two different tones. And then also just kind of um, like if you're, they're exposed to the sun or exposed to light, they kind of change in color over time also. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, then here are a few other pieces in that series. And so in this example, you can kind of see the text um, from the model statement a little bit more clearly. And so these works also kind of um, were the first iteration of what I'm doing now, which is combining elements of my belief practice with my painting practice. And so again, just kind of thinking about bringing everything together on the same surface. And so these were done around like 2012. Um, and then the last thing that I want to kind of talk about with the Beautiful Uprising series is uh, the patterns that are visible in the work. Um, so majority of the patterns that I use in my practice are created by the repetitive placement of Adinkra symbols. Um, and so I think they're most commonly associated with West African culture, um, but they just uh, talk about different concepts like um, life, love, relationships. Um, and so I wanted to add another element to, to my figurative work just to kind of make it more contemporary. And so at the time, one of my friends um, had a natural hair collective and the symbol was this wooden pick. And um, I was like, well, what, is, what, is this, what does this symbol mean? And it was a duafe, so one of the Adikra symbols. And it, the symbol meant like beauty and womanly qualities. And so I felt it really uh, matched with my work. And so I started to do more research um, into the Adikra symbols. So that's kind of how they crept into my practice. Is another example of that. Um, so now I'm going to segue into, um, I guess, the current body of work that I'm doing, which I see is kind of um, an ongoing project, and I'm not sure if it's like it'll if it'll have a concrete stop in time. I'm just kind of working on it until I feel like I've exhausted everything that I want to say with this series. Um, so the phrase "salt of the earth" um, is taken from this biblical scripture, Matthew five thirteen. Um, so it says, you are the salt of the earth, but what if the salt has lost its savor? It is therefore good for nothing but to be cast out on the foot of men. Um, so in this context, I am personifying Black women as salt in terms of the characteristic of being a preserver. Um, and more specifically, thinking about how we preserve our family, our culture, and community. Okay, we have a couple questions. Um, I think they re relate more to the last series would you like to take them now or at toward the end uh, I think toward the end just because I want to make sure I have time to talk about the new series that okay. I'm doing, which we'll I answer think your, yeah we'll answer your questions yeah. um at, after the presentation okay cool okay so um so this series, I really started to bring back this idea of um, duality with my practice. And again, thinking about um, bringing elements from my print practice and my um, painting practice together. So I work kind of in three ways. So for example, here is just like a traditional woodcut. Um, this is, was done on cherry wood um, on, on Okinawa rice paper. So, you know, the matrix is done with the intent of printing and addition, right? Um, but I also do works that I kind of like to term as hybrid works, where you can get kind of the best of both worlds. So on uh, the image here, you see this wood block. So I carved the wood block um, really similarly to the way that I would just do a traditional um, relief painting, except it's on a wood panel instead of just a flat piece of wood. And so I printed a small edition um, from the block to use as prints, but then I go back into the block itself and paint and do other embellishments or collage into it. So now that the matrix, instead of being just the production object now becomes the art object itself. And so I have like the panel here that I, I described this as a mixed media painting. And then I have the more traditional print here that's pulled from the block also. Um, so I have a few examples of those. So you can see again, the, the panel or the mixed media piece on the left and then the actual print on the right. And then here's another example. Or this one, it's carved, but then it also has like some hand painting and then there's also some um, collage in this piece as well. And, um, and these next body of works, again, they kind of uh, take this 
concept of, again, hybridity or um, bringing all these different processes together on the same surface. Um, the title of this work is called Prosper to Do Well, Succeed or Thrive. And I think it's probably one of uh, my most popular recent um, images. And so you can see from the detail that the flesh of the figure is carved. Um, the background is painted. Um, the clothing is collaged paper that's been painted. And then I kind of kind of work um, back and forth between all of these different processes to make the work seem seamless. So I have a couple more examples of these pieces. And so, you know, now that we're in kind of this digital age, it's kind of um, hard for people to really understand what the works are. Um, so a lot of these people, a lot of people think that these are prints, but they're not. They're actually like wood panels. So I'm literally carving into the wood panel, painting on top of it, recarving, and then collaging. So doing everything on the singular surface. Almost like a unique matrix. Or yeah. yeah. And, but these are done without the intent of being printed. Um, so again, this just, this exists in the world as a mixed media painting. Um, and this piece is titled, um, it has the wrong title, but this is titled The Founder. This is actually a portrait of Tanikia Ward, who is the founder of Black Women of Print. And so um, as I kind of go through projects, I'll cycle back and start doing uh, portraits of, to kind of commemorate the founding members of Black Women of Print. Um, this piece is called Birth of a Mother. Again, still the same process of, again, bringing all these um, materials together on the same surface. But this piece for me kind of um, reiterates this, the kind of a general theme of the Salt of the Earth series. And so aside from thinking about um, Black women as preservers, I'm thinking about kind of um, stepping into this role of motherhood and what that means to me symbolically. So I'm um, exploring this idea of the matriarch um, and also kind of self-care. So what does it mean like when we don't preserve ourselves as women? What, what happens when the salt is cast out, right? Um, and I'm also thinking about this idea of um, lineage or traditions being passed down um, from foremothers and now to my sons, which is kind of what this piece is about. Uh, so this is a piece, it's called How Janetta Taught Us to Pray. Um, it's an homage to my grandmother, her name was Janetta. I mean, like I said before, I've really been thinking about this idea of the matriarch, thinking about the women in my family who've come before me, the things that, that they've passed down to me, and in terms of like, what am I passing down to my sons as a mother? Um, so this piece, my mother and I are in a position of prayer. Um, and I think that's something that is significant to the women in my family. And that's one of the things that I can say has been passed down uh, from generation to generation. So. Um, as a child, I remember my grandmother, uh, when I would spend the night at her house and I would be there with all my cousins, like she would wake us up like early, 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 early in the morning. And so we would have to get in the living room and like stand and pray and then say like a Bible scripture. Um, and so I was telling my mom about that story, how she made us do that. And she was like, yeah, she made us do the same thing too when we were little. So uh, we kind of had a, had a laugh about it. So this piece is kind of a, an homage to my grandmother who has since passed on. Um, but that kind of legacy that she has established still um, is significant to our family. And then these next couple slides just show um, uh, um, some details of the work of each piece. Okay, so now I wanna talk about the current project that I'm working on. It's called Carving Out Time. Um, it, for me, it's kind of like the zenith of my Salt of the Earth series, not the end, but kind of like the climax of it. Um, so basically it's a large scale wood carving that takes you through the day in my life as a mom. Um, and so when the piece is completed, it'll be about eight feet tall or eight feet tall and 60 feet width in width. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the inspiration behind uh, this project. I'll show you a little bit about my process, um, and then I'll kind of show you some progress image of how the work is going so far. So this is the first audience that I've ever spoken to this, <laughs> spoken to this piece about. So um, you guys kind of get a, a preview, a sneak preview. Okay, so this image is of me. Um, at the 30 Americans exhibit at the Contemporary Art Center in New Orleans, uh, 2014. Um, so I was aware of Carrie James Marshall's work. Um, I learned about his work through my husband, who was a really, really, really big Carrie James Marshall fan. 
Um, so this was a, around the time that I was kind of um, finishing up the main parts of my Beautiful Uprising series. Um, and so when I walked into the gallery and saw this print, like my mind was just blown. Um, I wasn't even like, you know, I thought I was working large, like doing something really like special with my large, wood, so-called large woodcuts. But when I came across this, I was like, I didn't even know something like this was possible. Um, and so after we left the, the center and got back home and we're just talking, you know, art talk that we do, my husband was like, you need to do a piece that big. And I was like, yeah, right. <laughs> um, and so I was like, yeah, no, that's okay. <laughs> um, but five years later, like this is um, 2019 uh, during art week, I was at the Rubles Museum. Um, in Miami, Florida, and I came across this work again, and I just kind of like fell in love uh, with this work all over again. Um, and so my mentality changed from, I could never do anything like this to, you know, I think I want to do something like this. And so I took more images of the work. I, I even took like a video of this piece, and I just kept watching the video over and over again uh, while I was in Miami. And so it went from like, I think I may want to do something like this to, I think I can, I think I can do something like this. And so by the time I got home, it was changed from I think I can to I'm going to. I didn't know how or how it was gonna happen, but I just was like, I'm gonna do a work that big one day. Um, and I knew it wanted to be, to have something to do with like the theme of my Salt of the Earth series because that's kind of um, what I was working on at the time. Um, so I get back home and I'm cleaning up my children's room. And so it was just had been a busy, busy day. Um, and I come across um, this book. Um, so this book is Please Baby Please. And if you're not familiar with the book, it takes you through the day um, in the life of this little girl from like early, early in the morning all the way to it's time for her mom to put her to bed. It just kind of goes through all of the scenarios that the child goes through through the day. Um, it's by Spike Lee um, and Tanya Lewis Lee and it's illustrated by Kadir Nelson. And so when I was picking up the, the book, um, I just had a thought like somebody needs to make a book about like this for moms. Um, and then it was like, that's it. That could be what my, what my large scale woodcut is about. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of how the, the inspiration sparked. So I had just recently saw that large character is monster print and then just seeing this book kind of gave me the inspiration that I wanted to do a large scale life-size piece that takes you through the day in the life of a mom. Um, like a grand cycle. Yeah, yeah, it's almost, um, so when I was drawing it out, I kind of thought about it as like a film strip that takes you kind of through the day. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the first things that I did was that I just started writing all the things that I usually do in a typical day and the things that are important to me or that are like significant to my family. Um, and so the list got really, really long. And I was like, well, I can't possibly do all of these things in an artwork. So um, for me, the solution was to kind of break things up into phases of the day, which translates into five scenes of the work. So the first scene that um, I'm going to talk about today is called morning. Um, the next, it goes into homeschool and housework. Next, it goes into dinner time, bedtime for the boys, and then into the studio. So each of these individual scenes, um, is 96 inches tall and then like 144 inches wide. And so when you put all the things together, it'll be like 60 feet. So here's an image of me just to kind of give you some, a little bit of insight to the process. So one of the first things that I did in terms of like preparing um, sketches is, is I did um, kind of mock-ups um, just to kind of help me determine how I wanted each scene to look. Um, so who was going to be in, in, in each scene, what part of the house it was, what everybody was going to be doing. Um, and so once I got all of those um, sketches planned out, and then we did photo shoots for, to get reference images. And so we literally just picked the day um, and then we just kind of documented our whole day um, to help me get reference images to work from. And then after I got the reference images, I did kind of um, more detailed drawings that were done to scale just to kind of set the final composition to help me um, have more clarity in terms of transferring the drawings to like the panels um, and then carving. So here is an example. Um, this is the studio space that I'm in right now. Um, and so for me with the setup, I, I, because the images are so large, this is like 12 feet wide, and eight feet high. 
um, it's easier for me to work on the wall. That way I'm able to kind of step back and take in the entire image. And that just helps me with like just basic drawing things like getting perspective right and um, just being able to take in the whole image. Um, so here is an example of like the first drawing. Um, so again, this is the morning scene. Um, so I like to start on a black surface um, and then draw with a white pencil or sometimes I draw with a graphite pencil. And the reason for that is it just helps me to see uh, the contrast a lot earlier in the process instead of waiting till it's proofed. Um, so because the, the surface is already black, I can kind of have a pretty clear idea of what the image is going to look like. Um, and my intent for this for this project is to display the again the wood panels will be the art object displayed in the gallery space. And here's kind of a detail of the drawing. Uh, so you can see like the pattern in the background to create like the accent wallpaper. You can see kind of a pattern on the pillows. Um, so I like to do spend a little bit more time on the drawing just to make sure that I have a clear pathway for the carving uh, once I actually get into that act. Um, and then next here is uh, just kind of a detail to show the process, the starting process of the carving. Um, and one thing that's easy for me to do, um, just deciding where to start, is I like to start with the object that is highest in value, but that's also closest to the viewer. Um, for me, that, that kind of sets the value scale in place. Um, so then I start at the highest point and then all the other values are kind of worked down from there. Um, and that's also important to me because I like to have a sense of spatial depth um within the work so i'm also thinking about not the carving but also kind of creating this sense of like atmospheric perspective in terms of value and so here is the um full scene in its entirety um so i really wanted to capture the the feeling or the sentiment of just waking up starting the day and being rudely interrupted by these happy little people um <laughs> And I think uh, this is kind of a warm, heartfelt scene that I think a lot of parents um, can be able to relate to. And I think even, even if you're not a parent, if you're a child at some point, you have memories of like just kind of jumping into your parents' bed. Um, so I wanted the space to feel really uh, warm and inviting, but also really believable. Um, so you can see there's artwork on the wall um, that's uh, from our collection, so to speak. Um, images of like family members, shoes on the floor. So I just wanted it to feel like really believable and feel like we're in the space with us as this moment is happening. Yeah, and it's pretty much life size, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then here's kind of a close up. Impressive. How long did it take you to carve just this section? Um, so I keep a log every time I come into the studio um, to start carving. So the drawing usually takes about a week to get um, in place. Um, and then the drawing so far, I've been averaging like 100 or 110 hours um, of carving time. And then, you know, that's like stopping to rest my hand or to take, you know, step back from the work. Um, but the, the log was more so, um, well, one, I kind of knew people would ask like, how long did it take you to carve that? Uh, but also <laughs> yeah. for me to keep track in terms of project management because, um, I didn't want to like spend so much time on one piece and then, you know, be rushing at the end. So um, I just kind of timed the first panel to give me an idea of how long it would probably take to do the other scenes as I moved throughout the project. Okay. And then here um, is a close up. So from the last thing, you can see that the artwork on the wall. So here is a close up. Um, so throughout the piece, you'll see um, artwork is um, just a part of our lifestyle. So not only um, are we artists? My husband and I, but we um, collect work also, kind of on a smaller scale. But um, I think it's if you're going to be an artist, I feel like you should also be collecting work also, just participating um, in this ecosystem, like just to have work in your house. And it's important for us, um, for our children to be surrounded with art as well, just have a sense of like cultural agency um, to grow up with it. So, um, and then another reason, and I'm featuring a lot of this work is that it's me paying homage to like my art heroes. And so earlier I talked about Elizabeth Catley being an influence on my work. So this is kind of my interpretation or master study of one of um, her prints. And you'll kind of see these other like art pieces um, displayed throughout the rest of the work as well. Uh, so here is the second scene. And so you guys are the first ever to see this drawing. 
So um, wanted to do something special <laughs> for the talk today. So this is the second scene. It's titled um, Homeschool and Housework. Um, so this scene I think is significant specifically to me, um, I think, you know, the whole piece is about my day as a mom, but I think this piece specifically, because it kind of hints at how um, you can just get caught up in the busyness of the day, right? You have so many things to do on your checklist, and then you just kind of get into the mode of like, I need to get this done, I need to get this done, I need to get this done, I need to get this done. Um, and so I think it's, that's where the title of the work kind of comes into play, this idea of like carving out time, like how, I'm, how am I negotiating the time it takes me to get everything done? Like what's the priority of the day? Um, and you know, we kind of hear this phrase, you have to make time for the things that are important. So it hints like you have to carve out time for the things that you know are important for you to get done in the day. Um, and it's also kind of a play on words in terms of like me actually physically taking the time to carve out the work. So I'm also like, carving through time in terms of like the duration that it's going to take to finish this piece. Um, and I knew I definitely want, wanted to have a scene that referenced homeschooling because that's um, something that's important to me as a mom. So like pre-pandemic, um, my, my husband and I, we already made the decision to homeschool our children. Um, but I think now it has even more significance because so many parents as a result of the uh, pandemic, they were kind of thrust into this being teachers all of a sudden, um, on top of like working from home, all the other responsibilities of running a household. And now you're like, have to be responsible for making sure your child you know, gets educated as well. And so um, just kind of, this piece just kind of hints at all of those things. And I think, again, regardless of whether you have children or not, I feel like you can kind of relate to, to that in some way. Uh, so here's kind of a close up of the drawing. Uh, you can see there's uh, over here on the um, on the right, this image is um, a reference to Margaret Burroughs. Her work was another um, influence of mine in terms of my print practice. Uh, and this next slide just kind of shows uh, the starting process of the carving. And again, I make the decision about what to carve first by number one, the thing that is highest in value and also that's closest to the viewer. Then I kind of work like back in the space in terms of value. Um, and then here's just a close up of the laundry basket. So one thing that's been really fun with this project and also really challenging is incorporating things with different surface textures because I really wanted to challenge uh, myself with my carving. Um, and a lot of my earlier works, the only kind of textures that I would simulate are like skin or the, like the textures of hair. So I really wanted to incorporate lots of different types of objects um, just to challenge myself with, you know, how can I use my mark making to replicate the texture of this of this thing. So this is like one of my favorite <laughs> parts of this piece. Like I, I don't think I've ever been so happy to see like a basket of clothes in my, <laughs> in my life. <laughs> wow. um, it's, so yeah, it's that's that's pretty much it. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm about halfway through the project. So I just finished the third scene and then um, I have a new you can see here I have a new um, set of panels up and um, I'm taking a little bit of break to get some administrative things done but like next week next week I'll be starting on the drawing for the fourth part of the work. Wow that is uh, very impressive uh, ambitious and I'd say very timely and moving and all kinds of things. Um, do you have a plan to show it or is it still? Just oh I, I forgot to mention so right yeah. after that came up like with the with the um, I'll start up go back to here. So right after I like decided that I was gonna do this piece and I had the concept solidified in my mind, I was asked to do a studio visit um, by one of the curators from the BMA. Um, and so they asked me like, what do you feel like is next for you? What's the next big thing for you? Or what do you feel like you need to move your career forward? So I talked about a couple of goals that I had. And then the last thing that I talked about was this piece. I was like, well, I just came up with the idea for this awesome piece. It's um, gonna be like 12, eight feet high and it's going to take you through the day in my life as a mom it's going to be a massive woodcut um and so like literally like a couple days after the studio visit the curator called me back and they were like hey I have some great news uh, we want you to participate in an exhibition at the BMA and you'll have like your own gallery space so um yeah just everything like came together so I am working toward completing this work and it'll be um in an exhibition at the Baltimore Museum of Art later this fall. Wow. 
So how um, you have a, about th three more to do, is that right? Or, yeah, I, I yeah. just finished the third scene and okay. so I have two more scenes to go. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we do have a lot of questions. People are so excited, but uh, whenever you're ready, we'll move on to those. Okay, yeah, and then the last thing that I just wanted to talk about really quickly was uh, upcoming um, exhibitions that I have. So there's an exhibition called The Last Supper at Lashkey Gallery. Um, I'll also be exhibiting at the Child Museum of Art in Wisconsin uh, starting in February. Um, truth be told, it's going to be at the Urban Zen Gallery. So I have a couple of pieces there. Um, the exhibition, All Due Respect, um, is going to open at the Baltimore Museum of Art. Um, the dates were recently changed. It was supposed to open this March, but it got again pushed back uh, to COVID-19. So I'm not quite sure on the exact um, change date, but I'll be sure to post it on um, Instagram when I know the final date. And then um, I had received a residency award for the John Mitchell Center, um, but that has been pushed back to 2022. So looking forward to that as well. And then here is uh, my IG. So if you uh, want to follow me on IG, I'll be um, continuing to share more um, updates for the project and more progress images. You can follow me at Latoya Hobbs. And then my website is latoyamhobbs.com. So I don't know, should I stop share or keep the presentation up in case I need to go back? Sorry, I was muted. Um, you might want to keep it up because we might want to circle back quickly. Um, some of the questions came in early. They were about your um, Salt of the Earth project, I believe. Um, and that was, um, they were more about the way that you're mixing um, the wood carvings with the paintings um, in a little more technical in most cases. So uh, one of them was in the in these the wood is not printed, which I think we kind of covered um, yeah. right. And then are the models um, people you know or strangers? Oh, they're all people that I know. The only I've only done maybe two works ever that were people that I did not know, and that's um, the Solange piece that I think was used for the advertisement. Um, mm -hmm. But other than that, these are all women I know. So either family members or friends that I've met over the years at church or like in graduate school. So I, I purposely try to use women that I know. Um, just I, I feel like it's important to honor the people that are around you that you have um, daily interaction with um, and just sharing their stories because they're significant. Like people may not necessarily have like a super big platform, but that doesn't mean that they're not significant um, mm -hmm. to their family or significant to the communities that they serve. So yeah, I pers right. pur purposely try to use um, only women that I have either like met or um, know in some way or, or some capacity. Yeah, you, your portraits definitely give some strong dignity to your subjects. Um, they're, they're relatively ordinary subjects, as, as you say. Um, do you use separate um, separate prints for each color? I think that was referring maybe to the patterns um, that you use and how there has been a lot of there have been a lot of questions about the patterns and how yeah, you so apply I those. Got it in a couple of ways. Mm -hmm. So like this print. So the portrait itself is actually the key block. So mm -hmm. that's the first thing that's printed. And then the smaller um, carving, so I kind of do those in two ways. So I, uh, in this instance, this smaller pattern that you see here, that's kind of all over the print. Um, I have smaller wood blocks that I carve and just kind of pan print them individually over the surface. Um, so I don't like to carve like a whole nother block with the, with the entire pattern, just because having the smaller block helps me to manipulate it in different ways. So on one print, I may want it over the whole surface. And then on another print, I may only want it on the border. So it gives me a little bit more flexibility. Um, and then this larger pattern was just done like using a stencil. Like I literally just cut out, I think like a newsprint <laughs> stencil and just placed it over the print and inked it by hand. Okay. And um, Sandra Rouse was asking if you use reduction process or um, just multiple blocks. Um, multiple blocks. And so mm -hmm. I've only done like one reduction cut. And that was like this early, 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 early work. 
Yeah, so this gray piece on the side is like the only reduction block I've ever done. And I, I it's kind of, it's been on my to-do list to kind of get back to it. Um, but yeah, so other than that, if you see different colors on the block, it's done from either um, multiple blocks or they're smaller blocks that I'm printing on top of the paper. Okay, yeah, that um, Kyla Marshall also asked a similar question. So I think you've answered those. Um, we have a question about papers you use, the wood you use, uh, I think for different series, but uh, Mariana from Stockholm is asking what kind of paper do you use for your large prints? Yeah, so I use, um, I buy a roll of paper, mm -hmm. uh, it's called Okinawa, I think, O-K-N-A-W-A, -A. but it's a basic. Yes, that yeah. is what it's called. Yeah. <laughs> it's a I'm, a, I'm a paper nerd, so okay. I know that. For a fact. Uh, yeah, so I, I order from haramipapers.com and I get it in rolls. And so that can just tear them down to the size that I need. And so I, I like, I've been in the, the process of kind of streamlining my materials. So, um, so for example, like if you see, um, like this print here for this, this piece here. So this, these pillows are like woodcuts that I've cut up in collage. So the same paper that I use to print on is the same paper that I use to like make these textiles um, through stencils. And it's the same paper that I use to collage. I like to keep all, you know, it just helps me to streamline the materials. Now every now and then I'll like buy like decorative paper, like this shirt here is like the, this paper already had that texture on it as if it was like this snakeskin texture. And then I painted on top of it to give it volume and to make it feel like clothing. Um, but otherwise, like this paper here is this Okinawa paper, but I hand printed the stencil on it and then um, painted it again to make it look like clothing. Nice. Um, we have kind of going back to that question about reduction prints. Um, we have a question from Bo Randolph Bright Reed about that. And he specifically is asking about my fears disintegrated into nothing or where you have introduced color in your portraits. Um, he's saying that he struggles with skin tone and value. Um, in this case, uh, is your painting directly on wood on this, on this for the skin tones? Yes. Um, so Oh, and um, he, he wants you to talk about the high level of detail and the carving and the colors and how you kind of bring that all together. Yeah, so again, this piece is um, a mixed media painting. It's not a print. So all of the color is applied by hand. So the only thing that is um, a print is like the chair. So that kind of um, fabric of the chair basically is um, a print that I cut up and collaged um, to make like the fabric of the chair, but everything else is hand painted. And additionally, like there's paper um, on the floor. So sometimes like after, you know, a printing session, if you have like all these nice colors, you don't want to waste it. Sometimes I'll just kind of print things and almost looks like an abstract print. Um, I probably won't use it for like anything specific, but I keep them and sometimes they become like the floor of a piece or like I can collage it into somebody's clothing or something like that. Um, but in terms of like your question about the color with the figure, that's kind of where my painting background comes into play. Um, okay, so you I asked went about the founder too, kind of contrasting okay. the two. So I wonder if, you know, you could talk about the difference between this approach with painting and then, then in a yeah. piece like the founder, which is more the carving. So, so with this work, mm -hmm. um, it leans a little bit more toward painting than it does for making, although it kind of has elements of both. So with these, these pieces, the first iteration of these works, I was going back and forth with carving and painting and carving and painting the figure. So um, with this figure here, the first thing that I did was I carved it, right, to set this like base layer of texture um, to kind of imply like cross contour to kind of help emphasize the volume. And then after I did like the carving, then I went back in and painted on top of it. Okay. Um, whereas a piece, and you can kind of see that happening here too. So in this instance, the carving comes to a little bit more because um, the paint kind of stained where the things were carved away. And so um, I carved and then painted on top and then kind of carved away, just kind of going back and forth with that practice. Um, but with the newer pieces, um, the one you were addressing specifically, 
Um, so the flesh is left just primarily as pure carving. Um, so I don't go back as much because I, I'm really into this, um, the richness of the skin and these kind of dark tones, just supposing that with like these more vibrant colors. So I don't do like a bunch of painting on top except to accent certain places. So if you look in the detail, um, like all of this is just the flat acrylic paint that I put down and then what's carved. And then I maybe will do like certain highlights like in the eye to bring out like the highlights of the eye or something like that. But it's very, the paint in this, in terms of how it being applied to the carving is very, very minimal. Um, but in like the hair, I'll do, I'll paint the base of the hair more traditionally. So I'll take like a series of blacks and browns um, and paint the hair so it has volume and then I'll carve the highlights, right? And so for me, it's very important that all of these things look believable and look like they could exist on the same surface together. I don't like you to automatically be able to tell what's what. <laughs> I like you, you know, the viewer to have to be able to spend a little bit of time to kind of really decipher what's happening. Um, so I like to have a little bit of everything so that all of the layers, um, they're, they seem seamless together. Yeah, they do all blend together well, even though they're such different approaches. Um, we have a comment on that um, from Benjamin Levy, who um, asked, I'm curious about the how the patterns function differently in relation to the figures. For example, in the earlier series, they appear as flat planes in space in front or behind the figure. But in the current cycle, they seem to be integrated into the shared compositions. Um, so in the first iterations of these, um, like with this one, um, so it's just me just playing around with how, how the different ways I can use the patterns. And so some of them, um, they cover the figure entirely. Some of them are just behind them. Um, whereas this one, I'm in the, the newer works, I'm starting to think about things um, spatially a little bit more. So this one, um, instead of the figure overlap, the pattern overlapping the figure, I wanted them to feel like that they were in a space. Um, yeah, I, okay. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, we have um, a lot of questions about um, your favorite techniques and tools. Um, we have kind of a strong artist audience here. So what, are, what type of wood do you use for your large um, panels? Um, so early, so like my early, early works, the smaller scale works, those were linoleum, um, done on linoleum. Um, and then when I started to work larger, um, this was like, I was in graduate school. So, you know, I was living off $1,200 a month. So I had to think about how I can work large, but like really inexpensively. And so I started using MDF. Um, which is micro density fiber. So all of these images are like on MDF. So all of this series is on MDF. Um, and so I would get like the eight by four foot sheet from Home Depot and just cut them down into three sections. Um, basically the size that was the largest size that would fit the press that I had access to. Um, so like this image is, is two panels together, um, two pieces together. This is like one of the um, pieces that were cut from the eight foot sheet. Um, and so I was using MDF and then um, one day my studio here in Baltimore flooded. Um, and so I had like my MDF panels, like on the, my MDF wood carvings on the floor and then some of them got damaged. Um, as you know, MDF is basically a high quality particle board. And so once they, you know, encounter moisture, it's pretty much over. <laughs> um, and so from there, I, had, I switched to using cherry, um, wood panels. So the project that I'm working on now, um, these large panels are all cherry wood. So I wanted um, a hard wood because I'm doing a lot of like intricate details and I want to make sure um, that the integrity of the line is able to hold up really well because I do um, plan on printing these. So even though I'm, in, I'm, print, I'm exhibiting the blocks as the art object in the museum space, I do want to have like a small addition of the all 15 of the panels just, you know, for me to have. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, you know, you don't want to go through all this carving and then like never print them. <laughs> right. um, well, a lot of people were asking that question. <laughs> yeah. I think a few, a few people did ask that question. So now you've answered it. Um, so um, another question is, can you address the physical, physical challenges working at this scale? And what do you do if you make a mistake? Oh, okay, so I can go back to this one. So um, one, I just, I like working large. And so 
um, the full figure panels that you saw are, were basically one, one section of this, which is, um, these are three separate panels put together. So each section is eight feet by four feet. So eight feet tall and then four feet wide. So um, I was used to the height already. Um, so I had to kind of just wrap my mind around the scale. And so that's why it kind of took me so long to build up the mental confidence to even try to tackle this. And so, you know, as I mentioned before, my husband was encouraging me like, you need to try to do something really, really large like Carrie James Marshall did. And I was like, nah. Um, but once I got a little bit more um, comfortable with the technical quality of my work and I was like, well, I think I can actually, I think I can do that. Um, and so some physical challenges are, have been to pace myself because um, it is a lot of work. Um, and so initially when I thought the schedule was going to be um, in March, I thought the show was gonna open in March. And so I had to have everything done to be able to go to the gallery by like, I don't know, February, the third, second or third week in February. And so I was like really, really pushing myself really, really hard. Um, I started this project back in like, I got the studio space in August. And so I started like receiving the panels and painting them black. Um, and then you started like the planning and the drawing, but I didn't start the carving until like September or so. Um, and so this was, you know, I was still homeschooling the boys. School was in session at MICA. Um, so I was like spending like 10, almost 40 hours a week here in the studio on top of all those other things. So I was just kind of really wearing myself thin. So one of the main things has been like learning to pace myself. And I can do that even more now that the date has been pushed back and I have a little bit more time to space things out. Um, and because this thing is so important to me and I just want it to be really good, like I had to, you know, tame myself and say, okay, well, you can't stay up here until like three and then like have to get up to do class. Like you need to have a cutoff time. Um, so I started building in like a day of rest, at least two days of rest in the week where I didn't work on this, uh, where I stayed home and, you know, either did other things or like administrative things. Um, other than that, I think it's been kind of easy except for just the, you know, your arm being sore <laughs> a lot. So I've, you know, had to do a lot of like breaks and just kind of massaging my arm, massaging my shoulder, massaging my hand. Um, my husband bought me a Theragun, uh, like a fancy massage <laughs> thing. So to keep up here at the studio, um, just making sure to build in breaks um, and just not overexert myself in terms yeah. of like, because of my zeal to, to get the work done. Yeah, it is a very physically demanding ch choice of primary medium. Almost every woodcut artist I've talked to <laughs> discusses that you know the chat the what it the toll it takes on your body um uh they're, they're relating to the way that you manage your time which is i mean you do it sounds like you have about five jobs so i'm not sure how you do it all um but um mary wrote asks or mentioned asks do you find that keeping a log makes you more productive and keeps you motivated to get your projects done well, this is the only time I've really used a log. Um, so most of my other projects like are around 48 by 36 or like eight feet by four feet. And so I'm generally pretty good of like keeping up with like due dates and deadlines. Um, you know, honestly, I'm working to the wire most, <laughs> most times, um, but I didn't want that to be the case with this piece because it's so large and it's um, really important. I, want, I wanted to have time like before it went to the museum for me to just sit with the work, to think about it, to like really, really write about it. Um, and so for this project, I'm keeping a, keeping a log has been really helpful because it can help me keep track of like, if I'm spending too long on something, I maybe need to, you know, pick up the pace a little bit or, um, just giving me an estimate of, of when I can anticipate to be finished. So being, keeping a log has been really helpful. Um, and then I also set kind of tasks for myself for each time I come into the studio. Um, so like for this piece, I set the first task I set to, to do was like to carve the bedspread. It was like the first thing that I had done. And I was like, okay, let's try to have this bedspread carved by this amount of time. And so um, in some instances, it took me longer than I expected. And in some instances, it took me shorter than what I expected to, to um, do a certain section. And so that would kind of help me gauge how long it would take to do other things. Um, and that just really helped with my time management. Great. 
Um, we have another technical question. What's your favorite adhesives? What, what are your favorite adhesives? I, like I said, I try to be streamlined with everything. So I don't buy a bunch of different types of things. So for my collaging, I usually just use matte medium um, mm -hmm. to collage with. And so I'm using this Japanese paper that's already really thin. And so it can, once you get it wet and saturate the surface, it just it adheres really well. So okay. yeah, I don't. <laughs> Once I find something that works, then I, I generally stick with it. So I don't use like a lot of different things. All right. And we have a question of whether you've ever tried wood lithography. I have not. Um, so I am just so in love with printmaking. Uh, excuse me. Yes, it's obvious I'm in love with printmaking. But I've been the leaf um, because of, I just love the texture. Like I've just, I've discovered that about myself. I, I really love things with texture. Um, and so that's why I'm drawn to, to woodcut and relief. And I'm also like drawn to the immediacy of the process. Um, I've done like, I've done, you know, an etching. I've done lithos before. I've done screen printing. Um, I've never done like mesotint or aquatint. Um, but of all those processes, for me, I think I love woodcut the, the best. And also I can do it anywhere. So I haven't really taken the time to give back to, to other mediums, which I, I do plan to eventually. <laughs> um, but that just hasn't been like my focus right now. Okay. We have a few more questions. We are a bit over time now. Thank you to everyone who's stayed on. Um, the an, Another question is how you prep prep the blocks, but I think you mentioned that you, you cover them first and with black yeah, or so for, paint for, or, or ink. Yeah, so for this project, it's just, um, golden black acrylic paint. Okay. But for like smaller blocks, um, yeah, and that, that's kind of the process that I've done now. So even with these, like these pieces, it just starts with flat black paint. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and um, you uh, also won't, for the, um, I think this just relates back to the question. You you generally, if it, if you start off with a panel, you decide at that moment if it's going to be more of a painting or a or a print, or do you kind of let it become that as you go along? Well, I I, I have a specific um, idea for what's going to happen. So, like mm -hmm. I said, I generally work, I'm working in three ways. So, again, um, like with the this this piece, like this is done on uh, just a cherry wood panel. So when I do this drawing, I draw in a way that I know it's gonna be printed. So every part of the block is addressed in some way, because you know, mm -hmm. if, if you don't address it, it's not, it's just gonna print black. Right. So when I'm doing a piece like this, just gonna be printed on paper, I am, you know, in the traditional mindset of, okay, I'm just making this to produce an addition. So nothing's gonna happen with the matrix, like the matrix is just gonna be stored away. Right. When I'm working with this, I am starting the piece knowing that I'm going to be doing other things to it later. Um, and so here, like I didn't take time to carve any of the details of the shirt as much because I knew I was going to paint it and I was probably going to collage or do some other things later. So when I'm thinking about these pieces, um, it's kind of a, a back and forth. Now with like these works, I am carving knowing that I'm not going to do any type of printing to them. And so I can be a little bit more um, delicate with the lines. Um, so I, like, I would be so afraid to print this because I think half of these like really small lines right here, half of them were probably close up. Right. <laughs> um, so I'm carving in a way, I'm carving these really delicate lines knowing that I'm not going to do any printing on top of them. Sure. Now, if I was going to print it, it would be carved more like this, where the lines are a little bit more open. Mm -hmm. um, they're still small, but you know, they're detailed enough to where when I print them, they won't close up. Okay. And then also, like the clothing, nothing was drawn here because I knew that I was going to be collaging in later. So I just kind of got the drawing in place. I stenciled the background and then I kind of left other areas blank because I knew I was going to be collaging in later. Yeah. And then in the case of like here, what we see is the underlying wood in the highlights right of the mm -hmm. face and yeah, yeah. so that, that was one question um but that's so that's a, not a printed surface that's that's a no, leaf this, surface this yeah. is the wood panel yeah the carved away surface 
and underneath the wood is is bright so it shines through yeah so all of these light lines that's just the natural mm -hmm. color of the wood right all right well that concludes most of the questions there's one from lyle uh i'm not sure how to pronounce the last name castana gay uh, about the Black Women of Print as an organization. And I know we don't have time for that. So I would just encourage everyone who is interested in learning more about the organization to come to Taniki Awards Talk, Words Talk, which will be in March. Um, she's the founder and she was the subject of that, that last uh, one of the images here called the founder. So she'll be our speaker in March. Um, next month, our speaker is Stephanie Santana. So thank you so much, uh, Latoya, for your time today. It, you were so generous to show us your work in progress. A lot of artists don't want to do that. It was really wonderful to see that sneak peek. And now I really want to plan to come to Baltimore this fall and see the entire cycle. It's going to be, I think, really stunning uh, and powerful. So uh, good luck finishing that um, project very ambitious. Um, and thanks to everyone for, for joining us tonight. We still have people with us, so thanks for staying on late. Um, you, as LaToya said, you can learn more about her on her website or follow her on Instagram at LaToya Hobbs. And as I said, join us for the next in the series, the sixth talk of seven with Stephanie Santana, um, which will be Thursday, February 25th at 5 p.m. And to be informed about our talks, you can join our mailing list on the website or um, follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Manhattan Graphic Center. So have a great night, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.